Test, test, test. We want to get started. Um, first, let me check my mic that it's working. Yes, no, maybe. Hands up, fingers up. It's I'm okay. All right. Uh, welcome to tonight's meeting. We will have an overflow room, and some of the staff will direct you where that is. If you have a question, you'll be brought back in for that. We are live on several platforms, so you can go back and watch if you want to. And let me just give the disclaimer, if any of the online pieces go down tonight, we continue because we want to honor your hour and a half and this is your meeting and we are not stopping to get technology back up working. We do that at our um, city council meetings. We are not going to do that tonight. So welcome. I'm Nancy McNally, your mayor, and I sit on a lot of transportation committees. I work with the North uh, east uh, mayors in the area on the I-25 and east corridors. I work with the northwest mayors from Boulder to Longmont to Broomfield, that area of mayors. I work with all of the mayors with the, um, uh, the Metro Mayors Caucus. There's 56 of us that meet every other month and several other things, but I just wanted you to know what I do and representing you. I am going to ask Councillor Baker to introduce himself and then we will just go down the line. They will share a little bit about themselves and then we'll get started. So start thinking of your questions. We'll have microphones. Uh, we're gonna ask each of you, we're gonna pass the microphones, ask you to give your name and what area of town you live in so we have an idea of the areas that we have present here tonight and then we'll get started with questions. Councillor Baker. Hi there, really. My name is Bruce you know, Baker. Uh, I am, well, the tallest and heaviest member of City Council. Uh, I also sit as an alternate on the Rocky Flats uh, Village Committee and an alternate on the Dr. Cog Village Committee. I have four years previous experience, not the most experience, and uh, probably the most letters to the editor written. I'm glad I don't have those first two honors, so we'll skip over to the other side of that. Um, I'm Rich Seymour. Um, I live just five minutes south of here in the Westbrook neighborhood off of 100th, so it was great to have this here close this evening. Um, I serve on the Rocky Flats uh, Stewardship Council as well. I'm a liaison to the Special Permits and Licensing Board that gives out the liquor licenses to the local restaurants. It's a great board to find out what's coming new to our city on. I sit on the Parks, Recreation, Open Space, and Libraries Board, and I'm also uh, a liaison to the Jefferson County Economic Development um, Corporation. So uh, those are my assignments. I'm short, but not that short. <laughs> uh, my name is Lindsay Emmons, and uh, formerly Lindsay Smith, recently got married. So I am, call me Smith, call me Emmons. Sometimes that happens Emmons. for me, sometimes <laughs> that happens for the rest of the council. Uh, but I grew up in Westminster on 112th in Sheridan. I went to Sheridan Green Elementary, 
uh, Mandalay uh, Middle School and Stanley Lake High School. Uh, the boards that I serve on or a liaison to is uh, the Historic Landmark Board, the North Metro Arts Alliance, and the, oh gosh, um, the, the North Metro Arts Alliance and the Election Commission. Uh, so I got three there, but uh, very happy. I just wanted to thank you all for being here. It's so nice to see all of you um, here and just wanting to partake in your city. And thank you to staff for being able to set this up. Um, so just wanted to throw that out there and thank you for being here. Um, I'm Mayor Pro Tem Dave DeMott. If you want to know what Mayor Pro Tem is, because I get asked that a lot, <laughs> it's basically her backup. So if any of those things she can't make for a meeting, I, I step in and do that. When little kids ask, I say, it's when I run out of batteries, he's next in line. Nope, that's right. <laughs> so I actually grew up just up Oak. My family lives in the same house that I grew up in, right by Countryside Rec Center. Um, I have been on council going into my fifth year, just got reelected. Um, I serve on as the liaison to the Environmental Advisory Board, Inclusivity Board, the Planning Commission, uh, Rocky Mountain Air Roundtable with the airport. Um, I am the liaison to the Butterfly Pavilion on their board. Um, I want to give credit to Councilor Seymour and Emmons that they also both serve on CML, which is an important thing, and they work with the uh, CML to lobby the state for things that are important to the city and other municipalities. Um, but thank you for being here tonight. I would have to say, uh, in the five years that I've been doing this, this is the biggest crowd either sitting in one of those seats or on this side. So it's very great to see everybody's face for the first town hall since COVID. So welcome. And there's three seats up here and one over here. Hi, everybody. My name is Sarah Normella, and I, this is my first time on council, but I have worked with cities for over 20 years, and that in, I'm an urban planner by day, and I worked for actually the city of Westminster for eight and a half years, leading our long-range planning and working on our, down, our new downtown. And um, currently, as a council member, I serve on the Denver Regional Council of Governments Board, so Dr. Cog and as well as the Adams County uh, Regional Economic Partnership. And I am an alternate on planning commission because I get enough of planning. <laughs> um, yeah, and I've been living in Westminster for 11 years, uh, raising three kids here, and I love it, so. Good evening, can you, oh, yeah, you can hear me. <laughs> My name is Obi Azadi, and I'm one of the three of the newest city councilors. Um, I'm, ne I'm neither the tallest nor the fattest. <laughs> I'm somewhere in between because I'm getting there. <laughs> um, I serve on, I I'm the liaison for the Human Services Board and I'm the alternate for the Parks and Rec Board and the Inclusivity Board um, and the Environmental Board as well. Um, happy that to see all the faces here. I'm meeting many of you for the first time. A lot of you have emailed and texted me so it's nice to see your faces. Um, and thanks for coming. Okay, staff, who has the microphones to start passing? We'll start up here. And folks, we have two seats here and one seat here. We don't bite. We need you to give your name and what neighborhood you come from, and then we're just going to boom, boom, boom through the crowd. <laughs> Hi. We'll catch you. My name is Dave Paul, and we live in the ranch. And uh, and I just wanted to quickly say thank you to the new council and the change in the water rates that occurred right after you took seat, uh, took um, possession of your seats. So thank you very much. I think we all appreciate it. I'm Key Wilson, and I live off 72nd and Sheridan in the Shornburn Farms neighborhood. <laughs> I'm Tim Pegg. I live in Countryside. Ed Getch, Highland Greens East. Nancy Paul, The Ranch. And just go back there and then we'll come back up. Harley Brown and Stratford Lakes. Rudgard Ramsey in Stratford Lakes. Alan Farb, Hi, uh, Highland Greens. Ryan Bishop, uh, Quail Crossing, Amherst area. Sandy Newmeyer, Countryside. Linda Farb, and I'm in Highland Greens. 
Dave and Kathy Bell. We live at 72nd and Bradburn. Uh, Dave Benefill, Harris Park. Kathy Smiley, Arrowhead. Sherry Perry, Countryside. David Bernard, Cotton Creek. Yeah, Evan Hunt, and my wife Diane, we live in Stanley Lake area and uh, right alongside the 100th Avenue Freeway. Henry and Candy Pettit, south of Stanley Lake. Bill and Sandy Maffeo, North Arvada. Jan Rich, North Arvada. Craig McBride, uh, owner of Radiant Lighting and Electric, and we're just uh, west of the Costco on Marshall. Gary Bland, Stanley Lake Holmes. Laura Poyd, Arrowwood. Mike and Susie Walker, uh, Sheridan Green, just around the corner from the mayor. Chris Stimson, Cotton Creek. Lori Brand, Trailside. Uh, Jeff Kramer with, at Stanley Lake Marketplace with Westminster Calvary. Ian Ebersol, Tory Peaks. Judy Pepper, the Ranch Reserve Shopping Center. Claudette Ferris, Sunset Ridge. Trudy Forsyth, 106th and Wadsworth. Mary Lipsay, 106th and um, Dover, just east of Wadsworth. John Nagy, the Nines at Legacy Ridge. Diana Buskirk, Sunset, Sunset Ridge. Ridge. Regina Deezer, Sunset Ridge. Hello, Max Math. Uh, 60 years I've lived in Westminster at, uh, and it's not too far from where I grew up. I live in Hidden Lake at uh, 70 or 69th and Wolf. Randy Swanson, I live in the Ranch Reserve. Jane Banzen, I live in Waverly Acres. That's just south of Church Ranch and just west of Sheridan. Hi, Patrice Eichen and my husband Mark Rosenstein and we live in Highland Village. Um, Leticia Palacios and Carlos Palacios, we live off of 77th and Ox. Larry Lawler, North Arvada, future resident of uh, downtown Westminster. Debbie Reese, 108th and Federal and Wandering View. Kevin Esslinger, uh, North Park. Uh, Ken, Ken Chancho, 76th and Bradburn and Westminster Public Schools. Uh, Sean Tompkins, uh, Living Connection is just south of City Hall. Alex Kim near Ryan Elementary. Jamie Schroeder, North Park. Ruth Clark, High Point. The Miller family from Sheridan Green. Hi, neighbors. <laughs> Michelle Zajic, also from Sheridan Green. Bill and Debbie Teeter, owner of the founder of Westminster's house in Brad off Bradburn in, in Harris Park. Good evening, all. Thank you for coming. I'm Mark Kaiser, Lakeview Estates. Gary Shea, Harris Park. Yeah, Jordan Bendinelli. I uh, live in Sunstream, building a townhome in the new downtown Westminster as well. Karen Ray, Shaw Heights. Rich Stewart, Shaw Heights. Kathy Oyster Westbrook. Um, Emily and Maureen were in Skyland Village, I think. <laughs> Kevin Godin, renting in the area and looking to buy a house. If y'all could do something about the housing prices. <laughs> Dustin Lawler, a future resident of downtown Westminster. Julian Bendinelli, Westcliff, uh, also building a townhouse in downtown Westminster. Steve Brockman, Highlands Green East. John Kroll, west side of Stanley Lake. 
Shelley Seymour, Westbrook. Uh, Vanessa DeMott, Countryside, Walnut Grove. Uh, Craig Russell, I live over by uh, Westminster High School in the ghetto of Westminster. <laughs> Don Priscilla, west side of our uh, Alkire. Bev Capra, a lifetime resident of Westminster. I live in the heart of Westminster, historic. <laughs> Kathy Pasco, Northridge. Lou Pasco, Northridge. The Kretzel family, Meadowlark Village. Sharon Harden, countryside under the flight path of the airport. Teresa Lubin, Sheridan Green. Pat and Lloyd Williams, uh, Legacy Ridge on the east side of Federal. Randall Betty Wharton, the Windings, been here since 1967. Rick Andrews, Sunset Ridge. Roberta Bourne, High Point. Bernice Aspinwall, High Point. Uh, that's right across the street from the Westminster City Hall. Juliet Abdel, Westminster Chamber, downtown Westminster. Lori Goldstein, North Park. Josh Herr, uh, Franklin Square. It's just north of Westminster, uh, downtown Westminster. Al <coughs> Alex Koshitsky, uh, Shaw Heights. Don Fittis, uh, North Park. Brian Johnson from, grew up in Sheridan Green and now live in Countryside. Lexi Johnson, Countryside. I'm Larry Johnson. I've lived in Westminster for 43 years. I'm proud to be here. And thank you. Emily Brooks, I live in Highland Greens East and um, my husband and I have been there over 20 years, and it's the longest I've lived in any one place in my entire life. So I guess Westminster's my home. <laughs> the Messick family, and we live in Meadowlark Village. Carol Campbell, Legacy Ridge. Tom Jurgens, Sheridan Green. Uh, Richard Kintrap, formerly of Westbrook, now in Arrowhead. Carol Walls, uh, Spanish Oak, 72nd and Sheridan. Sherry McNabbs, 73rd and Sheridan. Okay, who's got the first question? Yes, ma'am. First off, thank you for having this session tonight. It's nice to be able to talk both ways. Um, and uh, my question is, I'll start with saying, I was pleased to see in the new um, strategic uh, plan that diversity, equity, and inclusivity is still there. I was a little concerned about that with the new council, but was happy to see that the commitment to those principles are still in place in our community. I wanted to ask you a question um, and also acknowledge that today is um, Cesar Chavez Day and um, Transgender Awareness Day, both very timely topics of working people, doing the jobs that provide our food and um, work in all the stores that we have here in Westminster and the restaurants, and um, the issue of transgender awareness and the safety um, and acknowledgement of transgender people. So my question for, for each of you is, for diversity, equity, and inclusion, what should we be doing more of? What should we be doing less of? And what should we keep doing? Mr. DeMont, you're on the inclusivity board. Do you want to share what they're doing? Um, sure. So first, thank you for the question, and thank you for being here. Um, I've actually been the liaison to the inclusivity board since before the election. So um, I think that those are things this city, and since I've lived here, has always held dear. And so I think that what you see in our strategic plan is things that benefit everybody. And it shouldn't matter when you leave your house who you love, how you identify, what color you are, where you work, you should all 
expect to be safe in the city of Westminster. So that's one thing that we're going to continue to do in that in our strategic plan. As far as the inclusivity board, they focus on a lot of those different areas about um, going to uh, take care of uh, different minority folks and such and make sure that we adhere to things like uh, Cesar Chavez Day and, and all those different things that you, you spoke about. So um, the other thing that they do a lot of is if there, for example, there was a some graffiti that was more of like of a hateful nature a couple years ago and they usually will make statements against that kind of stuff and make sure that the council is aware of those kind of things that potentially might crop up in the neighborhood. Um, I think unfortunately humankind has a lot of mean people in it so I don't think that's something you'll ever stamp out but making awareness to it is important and that's something that the inclusivity board uh, focuses on. I know I saw some members here tonight. Uh, Michelle Zajic is the vice chair, so I'm glad to see they're a very engaged board who make sure that they come to these different events and give us their perspective and make sure that um, you know we are keeping that inclusivity lens on everything we do. And I know we just won't have time for everybody to answer every question, so I'll just ask if any counselor has anything else new to add to that, sir. Well, I, um, you know, I've seen some other cities take um, uh, or make more of an effort to do activities and festivals that are focused on inclusivity, um, you know, parades um, and gatherings that There's provide an opportunity the for the community the to come together and share so. cultural and or um, their own personal experiences. And I think that's something that we could build upon in Westminster. Um, so I would love to see that happen, you know, maybe the inclusivity board can take, um, it can help us define what what more we can be doing in, in that regard. And, um, you know, with respect to uh, our overall, um, uh, you know, the opportunity that we have in Westminster, I wanna make sure that everybody has a voice and that we are hearing from everyone. And I think, um, you know, obviously there are meetings like this that have gathered quite a range of, of folks. There are people who can't make meetings like this, so expanding how we reach out to our community and how we hear from them is something that I know we are focused on um, with staff, and um, that's something that I'm hoping we can continue to enhance as well, because we need to understand what the needs are in our community and be making strides toward um, efforts to help uh, bring everybody up whether that's through opportunities for affordable housing or jobs um, or education, um, that's, that is something we can do as a community. And we've been asked to stand when we speak so that way back there can see us. Um, anyone else? Otherwise, we'll ask for the next question. Next question. Yes, sir. Just a second, we have a microphone for you. So as I stated earlier, I live in the Harris Park neighborhood. I live right by the railroad tracks. My life screwed is, is sucks right now. I have no less than 10, 11, 12 homeless camps behind my house. The trash, the dead animals, and the needles. Are, I walked down there today. There's dead animals. There's needles. All, you don't even want to walk down there. They go through your stuff every night. If you don't lock your car, they're in it. If you don't lock your garage, they're in it. Right before we came here, there was a guy walked up with his bag of stuff. I stand on my back porch, I watch this. I watched drug deals all day yesterday. I get to wake up in the morning and watch him out there going to the bathroom. The, the, it's, what, what do we do about this? I mean, it's, it, nobody will even buy the property next to me because they go back there and they look and they leave. The grass is all growing up. Last summer we had three deaths. Two overdoses and a suicide. We had three fires. The camper moved in down by the tracks about a month and a half ago. Two hours later, the police were down there and arrested three people. There's fires back there all the time. And I just wonder, have we learned anything from Boulder? Or is my house going to be the next one? We had an hour and a half discussion on this very subject. Uh, a week from past last Monday. Anyone want to share what the discussion was? And there's an extra special something because of the railroad track. Councilor Seymour? Yeah, thank, thank you for asking that question. Um, 
we're trying to attack this from three different ways, and I think you're going to see a, a big change coming to Westminster. Uh, that discussion that we had is we have to take a multi-prong attack with homelessness. First of all, we have a homeless navigator. We were one of the first ones in the Jeff Jefferson County side to have our own. That person is there to get those people in a right place because we do believe that they are still human beings. But then we also believe as a council, we had a discussion on this last Monday night, is we have to have a continuum to move them along to a better place for both our residents and for them, which is a process that our staff is. We, the other thing too is what's become hard is you can be as compassionate as possible, but if, if they won't leave, we can't, we can't arrest them and take them to prison. There's no place to put them. And so we need your help as residents to help our legislators and our sheriffs understand that we need protection for all of our citizens and to protect those people themselves. So we don't allow overnight camping in our open spaces, trails, and parks, and that needs to be enforced. But we also have to give them a reasonable amount of time so that we don't end up spending our citizens' money in court fighting the ACLU over that also. The 10th District Court said, hey, if you, if you have a bed for them, then you can move them on to the next spot. If you don't, then you have to make accommodations. So that's why we work with our pa county partners because cities don't have homeless shelters. We don't have those kind of facilities. Our county partners do, so we need to work with them and they are using some of the one-time dollars that have come in from the federal government, especially on the Jefferson County side, to build some permanent housing so that we can move these people along a continuum so that they just aren't back the minute they get back out. So, so, uh, so my new normal doesn't change. Yeah. I mean, so long right. just moved out last week, there's more trash than you would imagine. Well, and, and you will see this la two weeks ago, our neighbors at Spanish Oaks, same situation, open space at 73rd and Sheridan, um, but between San Marino and Spanish Oaks. We had some uh, mess out there. We had some campers out there. This last week, we had a concerted effort, contact, movement, assistance, cleanup, gone. And so we can't deal, we're going to have to deal with those at one at a time. We want you to report these. We have some situations. Along the railroad tracks, we got a little bit of a problem because we have to work with the railroad. And if any of you have ever worked with a railroad, it's long and hard, but we have to get their partnership on that top side, and they've been cooperating in that. But we need you to help us identify those camps. Some of them we can't see. Some of them our officers can't see. Some of them our, our homeless navigator can't see. So we need your help in this so that we can identify and move a continuum along that path to take back our open spaces, our parks, and our trails, and then we also need to work with our business community. Because if they're on private property, those business owners have to ask us to come onto their property and trespass that. If, if they're on HOA property, the property management and the HOA have to ask us for help because we're not allowed to go on private property. So we need everyone in the community's help on this and we need to move forward now. And we have a team that is ready to do that, camp by camp by camp. But if we don't solve the problem, we're going to, our VAT is going to be doing the same thing, and they're going to push them this way, and we're going to go back and forth. So we have, to find, we have to find that middle ground in there. But we need to defend our property, and we need to start defending our residents. I just wish it was in your backyard. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. Uh, I know I, they handed. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I have a different point of view. Okay. I think this is about. We've been we've been seduced. Our compassion and our generosity have seduced us. Our focus on inclusivity and respect has seduced us. Government is not about who you are. Government is about your conduct. And we've forgotten that. This is not a homeless problem. This is a trespass problem. 
The city of Westminster has very clear ordinances on trespass. We're not going to get there overnight. Uh, our compassion is going to really work uh, to slow us down on how fast we get there. But I'm a voice on council that's going to remind repeatedly that this is about conduct. Are we against car drivers? Of course not. We're, we're not against car drivers. We're against car drivers who go to the top level of the RTD structure and do donuts in the parking lot. That's what we're against. Are we against gun owners? No, we're not against gun owners. We're against gun owners who rob liquor stores. We've forgotten this should be about conduct, not about who you are. And the way I read the ordinance, it said, absent of consent, they've got to move on. I think we can do something about the railroad. You have the mic. Um, is it on? It's on. Okay. We live, we are the first property north of the water treatment plant, 104th and Wadsworth. We have open space between us and Wadsworth. We have open space behind us all the way across to Ammons. Um, my husband and I are over 80 years old. We've lived there since 1984. We cannot sleep at night. I brought a nice bouquet and I'll leave it back on the table. The open space is full of this. If these guys that are camping there right now, there's two tents. I've called every day, police department. I've called Ashley. I've called all the girls that can help us. We had a, a lovely police officer come out yesterday, and his statement was, I can go and ask them to move if they're there. But if they tell me to go pound sand, that's what I do. I leave. So there's not a thing we can do. I am so happy when they built the water treatment plant at 104th and Wadsworth, they made it out of blocks. Our house is not made out of blocks. It's made out of cedar siding. And we've lived there for 40 years. But what are we going to do? They just, there was another one that was south of us, and you couldn't see their tent. The neighbor next door, I said, have you called? And he said, no, they're not hurting anybody. Well, let me tell you, everybody take a look at this, because one match and our house is gone. And you know that the homeless people have to have matches. They've got to have a little warmth. They have to have a little something to cook their food with or to fix their drugs with. And we can't do this. So who's going to come and stand for us between our very narrow dirt driveway and the open space that's surrounding our house? Who's going to come take care of us tonight? because we can't sleep. Can somebody help us? I've called everybody at the city every day for the last week, and I've been very diligent about it. And Officer Rudd was just awesome. He came and talked with us and said, I'll do what I can, but it's still there. Now, there's going to be another night tonight where we have to take watch. We can't see the fires, though. They're down in Walnut Creek where you can't see them. You can see the tents, but you can't see if there's a fire down in there. So somebody help us, please. Let's get some things going on. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah. I certainly empathize with what you're saying. And there are certainly parts of town that it's worse than others. But I will be honest with you, this isn't a, a south par problem. This isn't a north problem. You could go to the parking lot at King Supers on 100th. My son works at the McDonald's over there. There's a gentleman who lives, he has a pretty nifty cart. He looks like a handy guy. He lives in that cart. He pushes it around. I see that from one end of this town to the other. Go look at 36 in Old Wadsworth, off 112th in Old Wadsworth. Um, there's encampment all along the highway. 
it's happening in every part of Colorado. And, and I'm not saying that to make excuses, but I want folks to understand a couple of things. One, I would certainly recommend that you go back and listen to the study session from two weeks ago that they mentioned. Um, I do believe that there's a continuum of care that we have to look at to deal with this in what it is. It's a multifaceted problem. Not everybody who is out there are people who want to be out there. There are some folks that realistically, we as a society need to realize there's some of these folks that don't want to live in a shelter, whether it's because they are using substance and the shelter won't let them be there. Um, there's a lot of different reasons, but I think what Councillor Seymour was alluding to, we do want that line in the sand. We would like to do it humanely and try to connect them with resources and then have a line that says this enough is enough. The other thing that I'll be honest with you about, I've been on council, this is going into my fifth year. This is not an issue that popped up overnight. This is an issue that some of us did try to address for the last you know, handful of years when it started getting really bad. But there's a, there's a, a funny thing in, in government, majority rules. It took four votes. We didn't have four votes. We had more like three people who were saying, what's the deal with this? Uh, meanwhile, I know that we were not letting our police officers do what they were supposed to do because I was hearing it from them. Some of the other things that I'd ask you to be realistic about is what's going on at our state legislator. The stuff with fentanyl that, you know, they're not, they're decriminalizing it, saying, oh, it's just the dealers. Well, how does that stop the problem? That's not realistic about the problems that we have. I would also encourage you to watch a documentary called Seattle is Dying. Look at what happened in Seattle. Look at the policies that led to where they're at today and look at what you've seen in the Colorado state legislator. We're gonna do everything in our power, at least I certainly am gonna to continue to advocate. It's not that I disagree with what Councillor Baker is saying, it's that I think we need the continuum. We need to offer the resources to the folks that need them, the ones that will accept them, because there are so many different facets of homelessness. I, I can't tell you how sick I am of hearing that it's only affordable housing. That's one component, and those are not the people who are out living in fields. Those are the ones couch surfing, living in their cars, trying to find a next place to live. And so we need to start being realistic about the multi areas that it is. But I will say this council is a new council. We've had a lot of things. We heard about water. We've had some, some big priorities that we have to do and we can only bite off so much at a time. But as of two weeks ago, this is a priority. Um, the other thing that I would mention is we talked about the fire damage or risk and that came up through the Marshall fires. There were several of us who asked and said, what is the risk to us knowing how much open space we have, knowing the homeless problems that we have. Um, this last week we had a very good presentation par from Parks and Rec and our fire department and they, they shared the things they're doing. So I just want you guys to understand, at least from my view, this is a problem and I do hear you and I've been hearing this for a long time. I've talked to residents for years but this is the first time since I've been here that we're, in my opinion, taking it serious. There might be some of my former colleagues who would disagree with me. Um, but I know the conversations that we've had in the past. I've known the questions. I've known that's like, what can we do? And I think that Councilor Baker has it right that we do have to find out what we can do so that we can figure out how to connect people with resources like we're doing with our navigator and then have that line that says, okay, we have to keep our residents safe. And, and at the end of the day, that's not keeping the homeless people safe either by not being realistic and, and letting them have fires in open space. So. Just my two cents about it. I don't know if anybody else wants to share, but I think it's important that you understand that whole holistic view of it. Next question. Dave mentioned uh, just recently, just a few minutes ago, and Mayor Tro, Tim, you just touched on the subject of water. After living in Westminster for 45 years, I would be curious to know from whoever wants to answer the question, what is our five-year plan so that when we turn on our faucets in, the, in our homes in Westminster, that's gonna continue on for five to 10 to 15 years from now. What is the long-term plan for water? <laughs> I'll start and then my colleagues can fill in uh, where I have some gaps, but that's a great question as far as where are we gonna be at in five, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, this council recognizes that, that is, this is a long-term uh, item that we're looking at. It's one of our core services that we need to be considered of, of our residents and from future generations. Uh, right now, we asked staff to pause on the water treatment plant for water 2025. And 
and what they are doing is they are then working with a consultant to say, okay, what can we do to retrofit what we currently have? Is this possible that we can bring down the cost, bring down the cost of uh, not only to the city, but to the residents and how much we bond? A lot of components go into that. And we've just had a study session about a month ago uh, that kind of went into each of the facets of what it takes to develop water rate costs. Um, and so with that being said, um, and I want to say about four months, three or four months from now, uh, is what staff committed to, to bringing back to council in another study session to say, here's what we've learned from our consultants. We can do X, Y, and Z and, and with this much capacity, with this much population, with this much land. Uh, and so there's a lot of avenues and variables that play into the future of water for Westminster. And so that's coming down the road. We were able to uh, look at our water rates right now and reduce what we have, uh, what we're charging our residents right now and still be in a good state at least for the next 10 years, okay? And with that, that doesn't mean that that water rate is set, right? Every year council is charged with looking at our water rates and looking at what we need to do to make sure that we're taking care of our system. No one wants bad water. No one wants a, a safety problem when, when it comes to water. And so I, I will speak for myself and maybe all council, that that is a core goal of us is to, to not leave our residents in a bad standing or health. That is a primary service that we provide and that's what we're focused on. Councilor Baker. I mean, really, Mayor Pro Tem makes a very good point about a majority. We live in a majority rule society and a majority rule government. There's a different majority on council this time. And we were able to go back and look at what the previous council had done. I'm sure you've all heard of Water 2025. Nod heads, yes. We engaged in Water 2025 without knowing the price of it. Would you buy a car without knowing the price of it? It's insane. And what they did is they raised the water rates that had no relation to the cost of producing water because there were other agenda items in that raising. It wasn't about water. The, I mean, the safety of Westminster water has never been at risk, ever. The people talking about it we're misleading you. Our sewer has never had a problem. Uh, back when we had the building moratorium, flows hadn't increased. So we've been misled, and this council is doing all the... Oh, and there's one more thing. We are right now in a condemnation procedure going to take a person's land to build water 2025. Well, if we don't even know what it costs, how can we be in such a process? So this council is now very cautiously and judiciously, perhaps I would say too cautiously, <laughs> moving ahead on the alternates. And we're going to look at, and we're going to ask the price of things. Because if we have two alternatives and one is $100 million less, that's going to affect the price that we charge everyone. Uh, it also goes to growth. Okay. Uh, I'll give you an example of something we just passed, the uplands. At the uplands, uh, the really developer claimed that he was guaranteed over 700 acre feet of water, which the city does not do. And he crowed about how he's reducing that to 530 acre feet of water. If we planted every one of the 235 acres of uplands in Kentucky bluegrass, it would only use 470 acre feet of water. So how we do growth is going to be the deciding factor as to whether we have enough water for the people who live here to water our trees in Tree City, USA, to water our landscapes, and to flush our toilets. And if we continue to take the uh, <laughs> opium of growth, we won't have enough water. Councillor Seymour and then Councillor Namella, you hit a nerve. 
Well, no, I was, I was going <laughs> to, uh, Councillor Baker uh, talked about the part on growth. Do we have enough water? Do we have the water budget for our future growth? Since we are about at build out, but then we'll have infill properties as well. So we paused, the previous council made a decision to pause the comprehensive plan that will take us to 2040 so that we can take a new look with the new council and go through that. It, it's about land use and it is about where we put things and at what density we put things. So the new council wants, and we'll start taking a look at that plan and how that's integrated in there. And the mayor is heavily committed to, too, is each one of those com components has to have a water use budget attached to it. So that's critical moving forward. So thank you. Councilor Um So our, you know, Westminster, in terms of growth, we are one of the slower growing communities in the region. There are uh, communities like Thornton who are going to be growing by almost uh, half, right? They're, they're 140,000, they're looking to get to 240,000. You're gonna see traffic coming, not from Westminster, but really from our neighbors and just from the region overall. But that's, that's one thing um, I wanted to point out. But with respect to the water, I am kind of concerned about the direction we are going in regarding the water rates that we currently have, and that's why we still need to do more research. I mean, we have, as Councillor Emmons pointed out, in 10 years, we're in the red. That is with uh, assuming that we are doing some type of improvement to either Semper, our current water treatment plant, to make it last longer, or we are doing another new water treatment plant. We, we are budgeting ourselves to try and figure out what exactly we need to do in order to accommodate our need but one of the things that I will point out is if you go back to our study session on water and you look at the pro forma, the, 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 I guess I'll call it a pro forma, but if you look at the spreadsheet that staff prepared for us, um, this is a $4 billion asset, our water system. And just like, if you, I mean, you all must own a house or own a car. You have to put some money into it to maintain it, right? So the dollars that we're putting in to maintain it, we are, staff uh, admitted to us when we were going through our, our assumptions that we were not assuming that we're putting in enough each year in terms of maintaining our asset. So I worry about our maintain, our, just what we have and whether we're truly maintaining it. And then I worry about, um, you know, have we budgeted enough in our, in, and if we set our water rates to a point where in 10 years time, you know, just to make 10 years, we have to borrow money. We have to borrow like yeah, not only 150 million, but we have to borrow just, I think it was like 50 million. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but we have to just borrow to be in the black for 10 years. So it's not an easy, I mean, just, I, and I know water rates are painful and we're not the only community that is, there are communities that are, you know, Greeley, when we talk to them, they're raising it like 6% annually. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to, what are we hitting, like 4% or 45 with the water rates that we were looking at for 10 years. It's a balancing act of trying to figure out how to keep living in Westminster affordable, but also how to keep our asset uh, maintained. So I, I, I am, you know, I'm not <laughs> convinced we have the right path <laughs> yet, but um, that's why we're doing all of this additional analysis together. mentioned the acre feet. Where is that acre feet that you were describing earlier? What is that source? The okay. Uh, Stan. Sorry. <laughs> we have, we have, I can finally tell you, we have, depending on the yield from our water source, and the vast majority of our water comes from Clear Creek. Okay. okay and they're using you know, 120 year old water rights, and we got pretty decent water rights on that. We can yield between 16,500 acre feet up to 23,000 acre feet a year. Currently, currently, we're using about 20 to 21,000 acre feet a year. So those 530 acre feet are coming out of that part that uh, in Colorado, you must use your water or you lose it. So right now, we're leasing to agricultural interests the water 
uh, we, just got, we just got done converting some agriculture interest water into municipal use water, and it'll be used that way. So that's where the additional water is coming from. Tell us, Mayor Pro Tem. Just a second, just a second, we're not done. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I just want to give some clarification. So this is a, a issue that's, I, I ran on the first time that I was elected, and I ran on it the second time that we were on the wrong path. I thought that rates were becoming unaffordable. Um, and so in my time, I basically voted against the increase of water rates every single time. This last wa water package and during COVID is the only time I agreed with the recommendation put forward, because during COVID, we did no increase. This last time, we decreased it. And I just want to give you some context around some of the things that we've heard. One, the balancing act that happens in government for any kind of utility always happens. If water 2025 happened, we were still going to borrow money, and we still at some point hit red. That's how they do it. If you listen to the study session, this was staff's recommendation, listening to the recommendations that um, Councilor Seymour and Baker had made, taking input from the rest of us about our concerns, and coming up back with us. With, they said this can work for us, and knowing that they're going to go back and relook at uh, potentially retrofitting Semper, um, and you know they, that's the money they asked for. This plan puts $150 million away because we're, we don't know what it's going to cost, to Councillor Baker's point. Um, the other thing that I would add to the conversation, and we do know that the rates increasing have been driven by 2025, even though they didn't know the price tag, they were guessing what it was going to cost um, to some extent. But one of the things that there was a hard cost, if you go and move to a new site, was one, the land cost, which is millions of dollars. The other very large cost is to repipe to a new location from the current site. I think it's something like $50 million to repipe to a new water plant. Um, the last thing I'd leave you with that this council's done, and this is a very important part, that I, I knew about because I talked to former councils, and this was part of the reason I was so rabid about we were on the wrong path. We had former city manager Brett McFall, former city manager Bill Christopher, one of the head, uh, Mike Smith, I believe is his name, who worked for the utility for 30 plus years, come and talk to us, as well as the head of Greeley Water and Denver Water, because we're, you know, let's step back and see if there's a different way to solve it. Because um, I work in IT, there's always 10 ways to solve, you know, the, and get the same outcome. And it all is different costs and it's always budget driven. There's plenty of times I go and say, here's the best solution, and they say, nope, you don't have the money for that. So I still have to come up with a solution that works. Um, but if you go with one of the things that they talked about, the plan was always, we have Northwest Water Treatment Plant, and we have Semper. Semper can handle the full load any time of the year, meaning when we're doing full outdoor watering, Semper can handle that load. Northwest can handle that load all but maybe one to two months a year during the heaviest use months. That is if everybody's watering outside. Um, the reason that that's important was the plan from former uh, staff and utility heads was always to be able to take one offline, retrofit whatever you had to retrofit, and run the water off the other plant. And then, and as they said, that it was, I believe it was former uh, city manager McFall was, the plan was to be able to do that in virtual perpetuity, understanding nothing lasts forever, but that was their plan. So what we're asking is, staff go back and let's go down that path again. What would it take if you completely replace the water plant Semper in place? What would it cost to retrofit it over time? Do different components of it. So it's a very complex thing. The, the, this whole council though, I will say, everybody cares about making sure it's a sustainable long-term plan. Um, I was really hoping that we would have a 7-0 vote on that. And it was interesting throughout the, the water discussion, we had a 5-2 vote that was a different 5-2 vote than what we ended up with because we made a little bit of a tweak as far as that top tier and it made some people uncomfortable with it. But the dollars and cents of it changed very minutely. It was about $350,000 which sounds like a lot, but I can tell you in the, the utility fund, that's a drop in the bucket. And staff said that that was a change that you know, was feasible that they could deal with. So I, I want to make sure that you all understand that context. And this is all public record. And if, if you can't find it on your own, send me an email. I'll make sure that I get you the link to the YouTube so you can listen for yourself. I appreciate your mayor and council being on the same page on that. Thank you very much. Councilor Yuzadi. Thank you, Mayor. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you. Um, did you all bring your popcorn tonight? <laughs> it's it's uh, a little more dramatic than I expected. You know, we have counselors accusing former counselors of misleading. We have um, debates that sound like campaign speeches. What, my, my only comment here on water is to say that I have one fear. I'm 
happy that it has led to some affordability, but to Councillor Namela's point, um, there is something that we should think about here. The one fear that I have is if we don't know what the new treatment plant will cost since we're doing this analysis, then wouldn't that mean that if it costs more than we expect four months from now, we raise rates again? I don't want a ping pong, you know, yo-yo rate up and down for you guys. Um, that's my fear here, and I hope that the analysis from the new consultant that's doing this will yield something that is within what was approved. But I don't, I'm based in facts, and I make decisions. So I've worked in the private sector for a long time. I'm, I'm a small business owner. I, I deal with data and facts, and I don't think we had enough facts. Um, and I'm, so that's my one fear is hopefully the analysis comes out in our favor, but we got a little uh, ahead of ourselves by making that decision so soon. Look at the, uh, the uh, I don't know who's next. Okay, Tim. Thank you. Next one, I'll take back there. So whoever's back there staff-wise, pick somebody. So uh, my question is for Bruce Baker. Um, you said that the uh, there was no problem with the Big Dry Creek sewer when the building or when the building moratorium was put into place, um, but I asked city staff for the engineering report about that, uh, and they they kindly gave it to me. Um, and the the planned usage of the sewer did exceed capacity. So in fact, the sewer replacement that happened there was um, proactive on, on staff's part, and I'm, I'm really grateful for that. But my question for you is you alleged that uh, city staff misled the public, and um, I wanna know what evidence you have for that. Okay, you can find that evidence in the really comprehensive annual financial report. There is, in the back of the port, a whole list of charts and it gives how much sewage flowed down the lines. And between the 10-year time period that was in the newspaper to the 2017, so that 27... That my, question. my question is, what um, evidence do you have that staff misled us about water rates? Because it didn't go up 40%. Staff said it went up 40%. The flow in the Big Dry Creek sewer went up 40%. It's a Denver Post article. Are you next? Yep. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Chris Stimson, Cotton Creek. Um, it doesn't really matter what else we get right, either on a federal level, a state level, or a municipal level, or a global level. It doesn't matter if we get education right. It doesn't matter if we get immigration right, health care right. It doesn't matter if we get all that stuff right and we get climate change wrong. Because we don't get climate change mitigation right, well, we might as well just lie down and, and die because that's what's going to happen. Climate change is the one <laughs> existential issue. All right, why am I saying this? Uh, read recently, the west of the USA is uh, in a 1,200-year drought. You probably read the same thing. Uh, <laughs> I read today... Lake Powell is down at a level that uh, if it drops another one foot, they'll have to turn all the lights out on the Las Vegas Strip, which doesn't bother me at all, frankly. But, you know, there's a bigger issue at work there. Um, we had... If you think climate change and a drying climate isn't important, ask the people in Lafayette. A th nearly a thousand buildings burnt because of a dry grass fire. If you read the Sunday New York Times last Sunday, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war is being described as a fossil fuel war because the economy of Russia is uh, uh, petroleum driven. And if we, and I say we, I don't mean just Westminster or the USA, I mean ev everyone in the West really, if we had been paying attention in the last 40 years, we wouldn't have Russia in such an important position. So, what, what, has the, what has the Westminster City Council done in the light of this really, really existential issue? Well, they reduced water rates to tell people like this gentleman 
uh, that yes, they can keep uh, using 21,000 gallons of water a month in their, in their backyards. Sir. They also said, <laughs> you mostly, most importantly. Stop, stop, stop. Most importantly. Everybody, stop, stop, stop. We are here for question and answers, not lectures. So would you please, please get to your question. You've taken. This is my question. We're trying to get to everybody, so the go. One thing that you dropped from the priority list of the new strategic plan was climate change. What were you thinking? Um, I'm, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm a stop, little- Stop, stop, stop. I'm a little surprised, Mr. Stimson. Mr. Stimson is the chair of the Environmental Advisory Board a city who has an environmental advisory board, who's had that environmental advisory board far longer than a decade, since, I, I don't know if it was prior to your time or when no, you were they, here before, were here. That, that you would assert that we're not doing anything. Um, because my answer to what we're doing is we have an environmental advisory board. Not only do we have an environmental advisory board, but the last council, to their credit, we have a sustainability department. I, I don't know how many cities in, the, in Colorado have that, but it's a nice thing to have. Some of the things that they're doing is, I, I like things that we can control. So what's in the city's control that they do that alludes to things that, that are car we could do carbon offset? That's what that department does. They look at how can we use electric cars? How do we use solar? I just had our environmental advisory board meeting, I'm first one as, since the liaison, because this is the first time they've met since before the election. And we went through a list of things that Mr. Stimson and his team would like us to look at as a council. I have notes that I haven't been able to report back because we haven't had a meeting, but we are doing things. I understand your concern about water, um, but I think that you also know that this council obviously takes it because it's serious, because we have the Environmental Advisory Board, we have sustainability, those things are in our budget, and we're gonna continue to work on those for the things that are within our control. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Karen Ray. I've um, I've been part of a very active community, um, and I've been in front of this council several times over the last several years um, in relation to open space, um, the preservation of the Westminster Farm. Uh, a vote that, uh, in my opinion, was an error, but uh, lost, um, and wanted to uh, pose uh, a question to this council in terms of some of the next steps that are taking place in South Westminster. Um, as uh, you may or may not know, the farm was actually sold to a multinational hedge fund called Varde Partners, a $19 billion hedge fund, not local developers, although that was what was uh, camp, uh, portrayed in, the, in front of the council was that this was a very local project. It's actually an international hedge fund that now owns the beautiful farm. Um, and the next ask that uh, we know these developers are going for, um, well, uh, and exceptions that they're going to request, like they requested for not uh, having an exception on open space on that land is a metropolitan tax district or in the city of Westminster it's referred to as a metropolitan special district a quasi governmental uh, taxation body that is controlled by developers and I want to ask of this city council your opinions because the city has a very specific title 32 policy, stricter than many of the cities in the metropolitan area, which have very high standards in terms of the requirements in order to uh, be met uh, and caps in terms of what kind of taxation these developers uh, can, can get. The purpose of it is to pay themselves back with interest uh, for infrastructure. So my question is, uh, since this will come up sometime over the next period of time to this council, your views on the Title 32, the, po the policy, uh, this city's policy 32, uh, and what it means in terms of uh, a private or a quasi-governmental taxation body that's gonna be paying a multinational hedge fund and why we should 
allow such a thing. No exceptions, in my opinion, uh, to the policies, although we've made exceptions for other aspects of this development. And to share what kind of an impact um, that would have, uh, I do have a printout of what uh, an ask for a taxation, a metro tax, uh, uh, according to the documents filed by this developer in 2018, in comparison to what a current homeowner pays, because it almost doubles what you pay in, uh, in property taxes. So the question to this body is what your attitudes are and, and whether we've had as a city, since it's been since 2013, since one was approved in this city, an actual study of what the city's policy is and mandating that there be no exceptions to these developers around their metropolitan tax requests. I will just answer, we have been drinking from a fire hose with all of the other things you have heard that we've been dealing with. I have not looked at this. We haven't been asked to look at it. It has not come before us. We haven't even done any study session on it. So I have no opinion at this point in time because until we get the, the pieces of information that we need in order to make a solid decision for each and every property that we have to deal with, um, it would be wrong of me to say I feel this way or this way because I haven't studied it and I don't even know what's going to be asked for at this point in time. That's your opinion. Um, it very well could be. But for me, I've been my head down looking at the things that have come to us on council that we have dealt with. Count uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you and thank you, Karen, for being here. We certainly... Um, know Karen well because she comes a lot and I appreciate people who participate actively. Um, this very issue, I actually have been talking to the mayor earlier today that I would like to talk to Mr. Andrews about um, what's actually happened at the Uplands because I can tell you through some conversations recently that A, I've seen us getting beat up on social media, which that's part of the game, I don't mind, but what I do mind is making sure that we get good information out to people. So I think one of the things that the city needs to do, um, and I think it's fair to the residents, is to make sure that they understand what was passed and what was not passed, what it did in terms of density and what's allowed, because it actually, you may be surprised to hear that it actually decreased what was allowed there. Um, I've heard a lot of things that we approved uh, high rises and stuff. If you listen to that hearing, we actually said we don't want to see high rises, but the reality is, None of that comes forward until they do a specific plan and they come back to council and then they approve what's actually built. Um, as far as the questions you have tonight, I'm much like the mayor. I've never actually been through one of those hearings. I don't know a ton about them aside from I know generally what they are and what they're used for um, and some of the developments in the area that have been used in the past for them. Um, but I would expect that staff is going to bring that forward if that's something and educate us so that we can make the right decision. And as you know, in some of the hearings, through the uplands, a lot of times we're gonna avoid answering a question because we have to be impartial when we listen to those, those hearings. So, but I do, I am glad you brought this up because this is top of mind for me. Um, and that doesn't mean that if you're mad at the decision I made, that's fine, that's also part of it. I, I get to live with the decision I made, but I want you to be dealing off of facts. And I think that there's room for just educating exactly what was approved, what's still to come, so that you understand kind of, you know, what's, how that, that development will move forward. Councilor Numella? Um, I've read our policy and um, uh, for um, in relation to metro districts and um, I think it's appropriate. I, I would love to see it updated to better clarify what the city would want to see if there were to be um, a metro district uh, allowed because there are some, there are some exceptions that are listed specifically like um, for a project that's like Bradburn, for example. And so Bradburn does have a metro district. So um, we need to be really clear and um, as to what the city is expecting. And that's what I would do for our, our current policy. Councilor Emmons. So to add in a few of the gaps um, for hearings, if they're quasi-judicial, and I didn't know this until I got onto council, is that if they're quasi-judicial, which means that it is a legal proceeding, is that council cannot be involved in any kind of conversations prior to a hearing that comes forward or that might come forward to council. We can't bias ourselves as far as information from one side or another. And so when we genuinely say we cannot 
respond with our thoughts, our feelings, our, our facts that we may or may not have is that we will be potentially heading into a hearing that could be biased. And then we would have to recuse ourselves, and then you as a residence and businesses lose a vote from council. And so it is very important, especially to me, and I'm sure my colleagues, that when a hearing comes forward, we do our absolute best to remain unbiased, that the hearing is set and we hear the information and the facts that are brought forward in that hearing, that's it. Just like if you were on ju ju jury duty service um, on when you're on a case. That's just like that. So please note that we're not trying to dodge any questions or feelings or answers, but that is a legal proceeding that we as a council and a body take seriously. I don't know if we've had anybody over in this area. Okay. Yeah, hey guys. Um, sorry to take it outside of the theory. I'm going to actually get practical here with the question. Um, <laughs> But, we're going to um, have an I'm actual a, question in 30 seconds. Yeah, I am a new homeowner um, in the downtown Westminster. And um, my understanding was that there would be some sufficient parking in that area. And I'm a little concerned with the planning for that as far as um, what I've been told now is that it's going to be completely metered parking at, at a three or four hour uh, maximum. So I know that um, some of the homes are gonna have a two car garage, but how does that accommodate for people that might be visiting, uh, maybe guests overnight? The answer I've received is that they're gonna be required to park in the, the across Sheridan uh, parking garage. Um, and we're all the way on the Harlan area, so that's, that's a bit of an unreasonable ask. So um, is there, who, who's in charge of that decision? It seems like it's changed after the fact. And then in subsequent projects, um, they will be having where, you know, two, three bedroom homes will have a one car garage and s without a parking permit on the street. So how will you accommodate parking? And is there going to be limitations for, you know, businesses to thrive if there's such limited parking in the area? So I wasn't here you. when that was approved. So I'm looking to former counselors to help with what the answer is. I will say I agree with you. We have a parking problem, uh, not just in downtown, but our, our parking structure needs to, the plan itself needs to change. It needs to be revamped uh, because much to your point, um, it is a problem. And it's very confusing as far as the four hours. Uh, is it for free four hours or do you need to get on the app and, and, and service and patron those businesses? Um, so I will say that we do have a plan in place um, for, for parking uh, and it's not just there, it's at other parts of our city. I believe uh, the other part is uh, the RTD station area. Uh, so it is a problem. I recognize it. I know staff recognizes it because council has brought it up. Uh, I believe the prior council has brought it up before. Um, so it is being worked on. I don't have an entire answer for you, but I know that it is coming forward. And I'm looking to my colleague who is part of- <laughs> She's dying to talk. <laughs> She's part of dying to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Numella. So I was part of the parking planning in, um, in for the downtown and um, the execution of it, I do agree, it's difficult to, because um, even I, even I get down there and I'm like, what, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> um, so I, you know, I, I think that, that interface can be helpful, but in terms of actual practical parking, um, we do have a parking manager on staff. I don't think he's here tonight, I don't see him. Um, I don't know if I could, <laughs> Mr. Burgos is our parking manager and there are things like um, handling residential parking. There could be permits provided. It is a new, it, it, parking managing parking is new to the city. So know that, but um, not new to our staff, but we do need to start to look at, uh, look at um, addressing our residential uh, developments. Um, right now, you're the first group of owners on the site. Uh, we have all of our rental properties kind of self park. And so there is definitely room in our parking management to be able to look at, you know, how might permits work for residential. Um, one thing you should know is that we do have multiple parking areas and we'll continue to have more parking areas up in the northern portion of the downtown. So that parking lot where the, uh, just north of the Alamo, that is also a public parking lot. So that where you can go off street and park, there's ov overnight parking is um, something that I think our staff will need to help 
our residents understand how to address that. So um, great question, and <laughs> we have staff to figure it out for you, and um, hopefully they'll follow up with our staff and get, get the answers back to you. I'm gonna ask, uh, Cody Erb is right there. Please give her your name and a phone number so somebody from staff can get a hold of you. Thank you. Um, Councilor Seymour? Thank you. Also, um, my, my colleagues can correct me, especially Councilor Nirmella, but also some of the surface parking that is there now, as we grow out, is slated to be um, multi-level parking also. So surface park, wh why build this gigantic garage when you're not ready to park things in it also? So that, that is flexible space. You take the asphalt, you build something on there. But also, I want to give my, my opinion um, and my, my fellow counselors can talk about this too. I would not be in favor of any new development that does not allow the significant amount of parking, off street parking, it doesn't matter if it's in the new downtown or if it's in any of our new infills that does not adequately have enough parking on site. So to think of having parking of, of one per unit is not acceptable in my mind. To have parking of 1.5 in one unit <laughs> is not acceptable in my mind. People have cars, they drive cars. We need to have those spaces available. Who's next? <laughs> All right, and, and folks, um, let's ask a question. We've got about 14 minutes left, so let's get questions asked so you can get your answers. You got it. Uh, good evening, everybody. I am um, in behalf of the block of 77th Hundred um, Knox Court. We are the neighbors of the home that exploded. Um, we are in a mess um, with the situation. It's been four years that we have been trying and desperately asking for the city's help um, to mediate the situation. I am sitting on a $97,000 bill just for the outside asbestos without knowing the structural damage of our home. I need to know what's gonna happen to the house and I need to know the repercussions that I am willing to take if I decide I don't wanna clean up my yard. The city has allowed these homeowners to live in their condemned home for over three years. And I'd like to be proven wrong. I have a six month old that lives a house away and has been exposed to all this asbestos. So as the city, what do I need to do to help you do your job? Thank you, and I know um, city staff has um, been in touch with the owner and I don't know all of the details. Can we get her name and number so somebody can get straight to her tomorrow? Or Monday maybe, but maybe tomorrow. Um, Mark? Thank you. I'm Mark Kaiser. I live at 72nd and Sheridan, right in the middle of the homeless. I'm gonna try and make this short and sweet and not a lecture. Westminster has had an overnight camping ban for many years. It was passed by a wise city council. Their first and foremost duty was to protect the rest of the community. The vast majority who work hard to pay their mortgage, their rent, their property taxes, their water bill, schools, parks, open spaces, streets, and other municipal services. They also realized the integrity of the parks and open spaces must be protected, not turned into personal latrines, a base from which to commit crime, panhandle, and squander their lives with drugs and booze. Now, I have an interesting job right now. I get to talk to people all over this country. And one of the things I do, we too talk about is homeless. And one of the problems we have in Westminster is Westminster is known as a haven for the homeless because we don't do anything. We have an overnight camping ban and we don't do anything. 
They come out to Westminster because they know they're not going to be hassled. So I hear we've got to be compassionate. I've been around some of the mental health. I realize that some of them have mental health, question, question, but a lot Mark, of them question. don't want to be helped. Okay, I'll finish it up. Here's my suggestion. Our biggest problem is downtown at the legislature. So everyone in here, I'm gonna challenge you that you contact every of your legislators, Governor Polis, and tell them we've had enough. Let's support our city council. Let's support our Westminster Police Department. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Grover Sardison. I'm a 36 year resident of Westminster. In all that time, I've been extremely proud of the police department that we have and the professionalism that they show. And I'd like to know, based on the fact that we've lost over 30 officers this past year and that morale has been at a long time low, what does the city plan on doing to restore morale in our city police department? And specifically, uh, in addition to any comments you may have generally on that subject, are you doing anything to restore qualified immunity to protect our police? Mayor Pro Tem. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. This is certainly something that's uh, near and dear to me. As you probably know, my father is a retired Denver police officer. You know, so this is a very difficult thing. And this is another yeah, down at the legislator problem. We recently met with our um, legislative down. representatives at dinner about two weeks ago. And my question to them is, what are you going to do about uh, Senate Bill 217? If you don't know what that is, that's the law enforcement bill that took qualified immunity away from from these fine folks. I was told, oh, we fixed that. And I said, oh, really? And they, they lied to my face and said they fixed it because you know what, that's, that's BS. They didn't fix it. They need to fix it. I think that I understand why they felt they had to do something in law enforcement after you know, the summer of 2020. However, they, they took it out on our police officers who had nothing to do with what happened a, a country away. I'm not saying it's right. It, you know, you gotta deal with bad apples. Certainly, I can tell you that Good police officers hate bad police officers more than you do because it makes it dangerous for them and that's not what they got into it for. But the bottom line is, is we need the legislator to fix that problem because that has driven out the amount of people you're talking about from our department. Some other things that you'll see that this council has, has been doing to support them is what kind of package we're offering our police officers, such things as Medigap. I'm not gonna go into it, explain it. If you wanna know what that is, I'll explain it to you outside after we're done here. Um, looking at our pay, figuring out how we attract people and keep good people on, in the city of Westminster, because that's important. The last thing that I'd add is this council just recently approved and passed an ordinance to allow the women and men of the police department to collectively bargain with the city so that they can have a voice at the table and make sure that they're taken care of. Good, e good evening. Question, not lecture. <laughs> Perfect. No lectures oh, this evening. First, I have to share so whoever is videoing. The video went down the first half. Um, we have a recording of it. It will go back up wherever it's going um, as soon as they do all of this. So those that are online, it is back online. We'll get to hear the whole thing. That's what I'm supposed to say. Paid announcement. Well, thank you. That takes care of one of my <laughs> concerns this evening. Uh, I'd like to thank the city and the council for hosting this. I think it's been very fruitful. But now here's the real concern that I have. I've had several people reach out to me questioning a conflict of interest with Councillor Numella and her new position in the town of Erie as the planning and development director. And I do say director, that would be an equivalent position to Dave Downing and having access to information going both ways. I asked the council, is this or is this not a conflict of interest? I haven't seen it as. I'll let you answer for yourself. <laughs> yeah, I never, um, thanks for the question. I, um, this is, it's a different town. It's a town. Um, and it's a job that I work at and um, I keep them completely separate. And there's, I mean, 
I don't know if anyone has any more <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, I, I've even heard her say, because she comes from a town, and when she comes to council meetings, we're a city. And so there's differences there. And so she always has that little break of just getting herself into the mindset. I know that. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, I, um, I am a certified um, planner. I have AICP credentials and we have a code of ethics and um, that is what I follow. And so um, I have followed that for over 20 years as a planner and um, I would, you know, I worked for City and County of Denver um, just before that. I also went to their ethics board um, when I got onto council and asked them um, if they saw any issues. They did not either. So um, certainly has been, um, you know, something that I've asked other you know, other municipalities about, and I do take it very seriously the separation between the two. So um, and that's that is my job. That is my certification. So. I want to unequivocally stand by Councillor Nermella, but more importantly, all my fellow councillors. This is not a full-time position. We have to make a living. We have to recognize and disclose any conflicts of interest, which we do and I would expect will always do. One last question. You shot that hand up. <laughs> I had a correction error. I didn't introduce my wife, Judy. <laughs> my, my question. Yeah, that was by the bell. <laughs> my question was, we had boats on Stanley Lake four or five years ago. It was taken away from us. I would like to see boating back in that recreation. What are we going to do? Anybody want to speak? Uh, I am deeply embedded in this discussion as I was before I got elected two years ago. And the key there, the reason the boats were taken off of Stanley Lake was a concern over invasive species, quagga mussels and zebra mussels. If you want, if you want to get lost in, in <laughs> Google, Google that and you know, you'll be up for days. But the key is how can we make sure like almost every other recreational body in the state of Colorado and Wyoming that is completely zebra mussel and quagga mussel free when they have recreational boating, how can we put in a place that safely guards the drinking water of North Glen, Thornton, and Westminster? And there are ways to do that. There's some inventive new ways at Lake Powell that had a massive infection of making sure every single boat, kayak, jet ski, whatever touches that water is safe and free of any of the larvae that would come into that water. So I would be willing to continue to have that discussion. Part of that is the total security package for our lake because it is our critical storage water and we have to work with our partners in Northland and Thornton and, and educate all of us on what safety measures, not just boating, but what other safety measures, and we're about ready to get a report on that, and then we can take a look at that and say, are there ways that are now available that we can safely and securely use our lake for many recreational opportunities? We thank you for your time. Um, 90 minutes, and I know we didn't get all the questions. You have all of our emails. When we get an email, we send it to everyone. We send it to our city manager, and we send it to his staff member. So it's lodged. They know who to get back to. Um, they get back to all of us, but more importantly, they get back to you. So if we didn't get your question answered tonight, throw somebody or all of us an email, and we will get those answered. I just want to share. Three things. Um, back on the back table, uh, the police department has a new app. And I use it because I'm, when I'm watching, w walking Mr. Gibbs, um, I can use this on my phone, pull it up, and I can immediately report the graffiti um, on our walks. Um, it has all the phone numbers as you open it up. 
you'll see in the top right hand corner a phone and you can go there and it has a graffiti hotline I call there it's much quicker than access Westminster then on the other side you click on it and it has a menu of the events happening their open house April 23rd um, from 10 to 4 all of that stuff's there so if there's a card back there you just shoot your phone on there if we get out of cards because I don't know how many they gave me to bring. Just go to your apps, it's free, and Westminster, Colorado, because we get emails from Maryland and New uh, North Carolina and whatever. Make sure you get the, the, the app for Colorado and put it on your phone. It, it's handy, I, I use it all the time. Second of all, both police and fire are having their academies this fall. The last part of August, one is on Wednesday night, one is on Thursday night. You could take both and just spend your week learning and doing fun things. So those pa that paperwork's back there to tell you about that. I encourage you, um, many of us up here have been through one or both ca academies, and uh, we ha also have a shred -a -thon coming up from the police department. That will be May 14th. You have Global Cleanup Day on April 23rd. So please, there's plenty of opportunities. We need you engaged. We need to hear from you. It's fine. We need to disagree. You hear us. You heard lots of voices up here tonight. I think you're well represented. And we, we go through that discussion. We come to the consensus we can come to to move forward. But you've heard you've got seven different voices up here looking for your voices to be heard and we want your eyes we only have a hundred and some police officers we're down several but they only have to a pair of eyes we need all of your pairs of eyes looking for those homeless camps the night we had the um the study session i gave them a list of eight camps i knew about they were all visited the next morning. We, you have to, you need to ha be our eyes and ears and report this stuff. Trust me, we've, we we're hiring a second navigator to help the process. And what I heard through that hour and a half, we didn't have good communication amongst the people we needed communication. And we had no process. That is changing and there will be signs in our open space. It couldn't happen overnight. But there will be signs, and in some cases, you're going to see some of the open space configure a little differently so it's more useful for your walking, for trails, and for things that aren't positive for camping. So it, you're being heard. It just can't happen overnight. But what this city staff has done in one week's time has been amazing to me. So it's coming. It's but we need to know where it is. Don't sit there and be angry if you haven't told us where the problems are. We need you, and from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for being here tonight. Thanks. Thank